Let us pray. Let's have gracious Heavenly Father. We know there are trees and things down everywhere. And you protect our man Avery as he's out there working in this. And the others that are doing that also, Lord. And we thank you that we have these people that will go and do those things. But most of all, Lord, we come to seek and find. You tell us those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And we come today to be filled with your mercy, your love, and the understanding of your word. And again, everyone here, Lord, I pray a special blessing on them that they'll feel the comfort and peace that comes from being in your house. And again, Lord, we pray for the service to continue and our safe passage to and from our destination until we meet again. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we've gone to the sixth chapter. There's a thirst within each of us that will never be quenched until we eat of all things bread. Not ordinary bread, but the bread of life. How can bread quench the thirst? We find the answer in John 6.35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Sometimes we're more concerned about physical bread than spiritual bread. We find that most people do not know how to satisfy the desires of life. They do not know that God has given us the thirst for the kingdom of heaven and how to get there by accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. They try to quench the thirst for salvation and physical satisfaction or mental satisfaction. <clears throat> However, only when they partake of the bread of life can the thirst for salvation be quenched. Jesus feeds 5,000, but that will not quench their thirst for salvation. Maybe we have plenty to eat to satisfy our physical body, but that will not quench the thirst for salvation. Even when Jesus calms the storms in our life, that will not quench the thirst for salvation. So let's encourage each other to partake of the bread of life and quench their thirst. When Jesus meets our physical needs, that will not quench the thirst for salvation. And how do we get salvation? Jesus Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then, when Jesus comes the stormy waves in our life, that will not quench the thirst for salvation. And how do we get salvation? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's correct. And faith in Jesus is the only way to quench our spiritual thirst. Who gave us the bread of life? What did Moses give us? Manna. Manna. But he didn't do it himself. He prayed to God in heaven. But Jesus came down and he gives us the true bread of life. So first of all, we're going to look in John 6 chapter... When Jesus meets our physical needs, that will not quench the thirst. Jesus has to help us understand what his ministry is. What is Jesus' ministry on life, on this earth? To find the lost. To bring the lost. Well, Jesus is going to test his disciples. Now, we don't want to be too hard on them because we know the answer because we've read ahead and we know what the answer is. But the challenge to us, how do we handle when we're tested daily. We are tested daily and we're going to see that if we follow Philip and Andrew's way, it's going to be a while until we get back where we belong. Mm -hmm. At the first verse, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was not. Now Jesus is going to ask Philip a very difficult question. There's 5,000 people out there. Philip, how are we going to buy the bread? All right. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he said himself knew what he would do. What is Philip going to do? Is he going to be smart enough? To turn around and say, Jesus, Lord, you have the answers to life questions, so tell me what we're going to do. 
What does Philip do? Had Philip known the scriptures or remembered the scriptures of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, he would have done what we need to do, which is, in all our ways, acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. But he's not following the scriptures as we know to do, don't we? We know to follow the scriptures and get God involved. But Philip is going to do what, see what he can do by himself before he asks Jesus. When the answer is right beside of him, who is standing right beside of Philip? Jesus standing right there. And so he's, going to, he's not going to turn to Jesus right away, which is a lot of times we don't do that. And, but we remember Philip's 4.13, Philippians 4.13, don't we? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus knows what he's going to do, but he's going to let him flounder around for a while like he does us when we go floundering around trying to find what to do about everything. And hopefully they will come to the right conclusion that Jesus is the answer to all of life's problems. Prayer to Jesus. Well, first thing that old uh, Philip does, he looks to see how much money it would take or how much money was around. And Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. Well, what do we know about little? Little is what? Little. It's much. With God is in it. Little is much. We may not have everything we need, but all we have to do is to turn it over to God and little becomes much when God is in it. Like Philip, many times we see no way out. We've been in situations where we think, oh Lord, it's not ever going to turn out like I want it. Things look pretty bleak. When we see hopeless situations, what is the first thing we need to do? Talk to God. Talk to God, that's right. For guidance, comfort, strength, to get through to them, get through it all. Well, Andrew is not no slacker. He's one of the guys, he probably heard Jesus ask, Philip that, so he gets a head start. He goes out there and starts searching the crowd for food. Well, what's he going to find? Well, we find that he's going to come back. Andrew comes back and says, no way do we have enough food. The only thing we have is five barley loaves and two small fishes to feed this crowd. How long do you think two barley loaves and fishes are going to last for 5,000 people? A lot because God is in it. That's right. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? What should we do when we're faced with testing in our daily living? Go to God. Whether small or seemingly possible, go directly to God for guidance. Because Jesus has the answer. And here's Jesus beginning to work. And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. There was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, the number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves which he had given thanks. He distributed to the disciples, and the disciples of them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. What is the key word in that last sentence? The lost. God wants us to gather up all the fragments out in our community. There's so many out there that need Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you can speak to them, and you'll have a better rapport with them than I do. Because when I come, they know I'm going to ask them to come to church. And I ask a lot of people to come to church, and some do, and some don't, some go to another church. But you can speak to them, and they might be called off guard. What do you mean about church? And so, but that's the key word here. Our requirements are to gather up these children so that none would be lost. We find in the 13th verse, Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is the truth. This is the prophet that should come into the world. Feeding 5,000 
But he's done a greater miracle than the 5,000. What has he done? What has he done to our lives? He's given us Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's right. Yeah. He has given us these things. The greatest miracle is when somebody comes to Jesus Christ as their Savior. The greatest miracle in the world. And you know how hard it is out in that community for people to know and believe. And we are being invaded by Muslims, Buddhists, and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Mormons, and all these people who give the wrong directions to Jesus Christ. So the greatest miracle is when a good person comes to Jesus Christ. And no greater miracle than this when we find salvation. When Jesus performs a miracle of salvation in life and we know accept Jesus Christ our Savior, what should we say? PTL. Praise the Lord. And to God be the glory. When these people walked with Jesus, they were impressed. But they were looking for all the wrong things. And that's what chapter John 17 chapter tells us, that we're really blessed because we believe, having not seen, but have the hope for the future. And when Jesus calms the storms, the stormy waves, that will not quench the thirst. When we try to use Jesus for the wrong reasons, He's just not going to help us. What was the wrong reason they tried to use Jesus for? Earthly king instead of heavenly king. When Jesus therefore perceived they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into the mountain himself alone. There's always a temptation to use Jesus for what we want. For our wills, not his. How do we find out if we're doing his will? We must consult his word, pray, if we're doing His will. When storms come into our life, we must remember the command that Jesus gave His disciples. It is I be not afraid. Storms come in our life, we can remember Jesus tells us, it is I be not afraid. Fussing and fretting, does that help us a whole lot? Well, it will get us nowhere. We might make us feel a little better to jump up and down and holler, go in a room. Sometimes you need to go in a room and just scream, shut the door so nobody can hear you. That, that'll help the But most of all, cast our, all of your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. Well, we find His disciples facing the storm. They go out on the sea where the winds come up really quickly and brisk quite often. And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh into the ship, and they were afraid. But what did Jesus tell them? But he says unto them, It is I, be not afraid. And that's what he's telling you and I today when the storms come into our life. It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship. And near the ship was as the land where they went. Jesus is waiting to enter our lives. Expect him. Invite him to be there. As a Christian, we do not need to be afraid. Fear comes to being afraid that we're not going to get what we want. You ever been in that place where you didn't get what you want? I think we have. Fear comes to being afraid we're not going to get what we want. And we're also afraid of what people might think. Mm -hmm. Receiving Jesus and having faith will come many storms of life. And this is where we quench the Spirit. When we seek the Kingdom of God, we have seen that taking care of physical needs and common storms have not quenched this thirst. We find that people were seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons. And we find that happening a lot of times that people are, are going to this church, that church, trying to get the mental relief. 
But the day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw there was none other boat there, save that one where he and his disciples were entered, and Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto this place, where they did eat bread, and after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took sheep and shipping and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi, when came us thou hither? How in the world did you get over here? Did you walk all the way around, which takes a couple of days? Or did you swim across the sea? How did you get here? Well, Jesus is looking into why they're there. And he says, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, because ye did any of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth the everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Well, we, he's asking a question that we need to answer. What are we laboring so hard for? We have to have work to eat. We have to have a place to call home. We have to have shelter. But most of all, we need to do the work that God wants us to do. And then it dawned on them, and they asked, you know, what is that work, God? That is more important than our physical satisfaction? Tell us what is the real work of God that God wants us to do. Of course, we know that believe on Jesus and show our love by following His commands. And He tells them in the 28th verse, Then said they unto Him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on Him whom He has sinned. What is the work of God? to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. The greatest work we can do is believe Jesus died for our sins and rose again and sitting at the right hand of the Father. This puts us in a position that our life can be guided and comforted by the Holy Spirit. So you need to pray each day, Lord, anoint me with the Holy Spirit that I'll do the things that are right, that I'll, even I'm going to school, going to work, wherever I'm going, well, the people wanted something more than just faith in Jesus. They wanted a sign. You know, and Jesus told the people that day and now, the only sign you're going to get is what? What's the man's name? Starts with a J. He went on the ship and on the way. Sign of Jonah in the belly of the whale. That's what he said. And he's in the habit for three days, and he's out again. So, but you know, people, I find people wandering around all day long. Oh, this got to be a sign. That's got to be a sign. And, and they, they know for sure that God's given them a sign. But he says there'll be no signs except showing in the belly of the well. And, but do we need a sign to believe? What does it take for us to believe? Faith in God's holy word, where he explains Jesus in Romans 10, 9, and 10. He tells us how to be saved, how we need to come. And, and 10, 9 says that if you shall confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So that's what we've got to tell people, how they can become Christians and how they can have everything in God's name. These people saw Jesus standing before them, yet they were not satisfied. They asked him for a sign. And so the word points to Jesus and how we can be saved and can believe. Can you do what Moses did? They said, you know, Moses was their favorite man. Moses was one of the greatest people in their life. And so they said, you know what Moses did? He gave us a mountain, bread from heaven. And Jesus got to straighten them out. He says, Therefore they said unto him, With what sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What does thou work? And that's something standing right before Jesus. 
and eat Messiah. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But Jesus said, what you can really understand is Moses did not give you the bread, but it came from God. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, which means truly, truly, I say unto you, Moses gives you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gives the true bread from heaven. Moses was only asking God to give intercessory prayer. Hopefully you, these people will come to your mind, everybody sitting in the congregation, come to your mind sometime this week and you'll pray for them. There's a lot of people are hiding uh, emotions and sorrow and sadness and we can give them a lift up. Because all these people come to my mind, I try to pray for you. You know, if somebody comes to your mind, don't get, uh, remember all the bad things they've done, but pray for them. Pray that they'll turn around and do things differently. But intercessory prayer is our greatest weapon. Pray for our church, pray for our nation. And when someone comes to mind, pray for them. The bread God gave you during Moses' time was not the true bread, but Jesus says, I am the true bread. And he tells in the 33rd verse, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The bread that you first received was physical, and it keeps you alive. But to be alive forever, what kind of bread must we have? Bread of life. Bread of life. To be alive forever and to be in God's kingdom. All of you here that I, I believe really know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you don't, you know, you can come today and acknowledge Him. But the bread that you first received was physical, and it keeps you alive. But to be alive forevermore, you must know that Jesus is the bread of eternal life. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And they still didn't understand. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Find a way to quench the thirst and desires in our life. There's desire that shall be quenched. Never quits until we believe. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Come to this fountain, so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in the day and be made complete. Glory to his name. Jesus died, rose again. And what else is he going to do? He's going to come back to get us. And we're ready because we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. And that's the only way you can be ready when Jesus comes again. So let's encourage each other that God wants us to follow His Word. Let us learn of His Word. Let us be reminded to think about each activity and how His Word reflects on that. So today we've seen that when Jesus meets our physical needs, that will not quench the thirst. For we must have Jesus Christ as our Savior. When Jesus calms the stormy ways, that will not quench the thirst. For we must have Jesus Christ as our Savior. And to quench the thirst, we must accept Jesus as Savior, as Romans 10, 9 and 10 and 13 tell us. So go home and look up Romans 10, 9, 10 and 13. And remember that. That is how we, what, how we become saved. <clears throat> and then, remember, Jesus did not give Moses the bread of life, but God gave Jesus for us to be the bread of life. He haven't made it perfect, public, that Jesus is your Savior. This is the day of salvation.